Welcome to Gardening Green Expo, everybody. The sponsors of the expo are the NSRWA, the Water Smart Program, and Kennedy's Country Gardens. Now, before we get started, I wanted to let you know that we're going to do a Q&A at the end. So if you have a question, if you hover your mouse at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A icon. Just type your questions in there, and then I will read those at the end of the presentation. So now I would like to present Kristen Nicholson. Thank you, finally. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you for hopefully getting some entertainment from my very not technical skills. Um, tonight, I am going to throw an absolute uh, encyclopedia of information at you. So I'm going to talk fast. Uh, hopefully I can remember to breathe and I might take a couple of drinks. Um, a lot of information. So it's a good thing this is being recorded because I fully expect that you will want to um, go back and watch it again. So I'm going to talk real fast and I'm going to go through it as fast as I can. Happy to answer any questions at the end. So we're going to go through um, the act like the very nitty gritty of building native plant garden, how to be as sustainable as possible, um, really from scratch. I'm going to go into all the details. Who we are, um, Blue Stem Natives, we're a women owned native plant nursery garden center. We're focused on um, our, our main goal is to increase the education and availability of native plants for the homeowners. Um, we strive to grow local ecotype plants from seed as much as possible. And we're committed to using environmentally and ecologically friendly practices. Um, our passion is really making native plants more accessible uh, to the everyday gardener and uh, increasing awareness as to the benefits in the landscape. Uh, we have um, the nursery and the garden center, so you can come and buy your plants. Um, it's very cute. We have our own little space. Uh, we have a seed farm that we are working on growing um, local ecotype seeds from that we also uh, collect and we sell and we grow from. And we also provide education with uh, garden consultations, presentations, and workshops. So what got me started with native plants? It wasn't all that long ago. I don't consider myself a newbie anymore, but I'm definitely still in the... Um, the beginning stages. It was about five years ago. Um, I had one of those light bulb moments, Dr. Talamy. He is um, one of my absolute favorite people. Um, I was a dental assistant for 18 years and I got bored. So I went back to school to, to uh, get my degree in biology. Um, I heard Dr. Talamy's bringing nature home and a light bulb went off for me. Um, I knew that this was what I've been looking for. This was what I was meant to do. So I was one of the founding board members of Wild One South Shore Mass. I discovered this deep interest and I realized that this was it. This was what I wanted to do. I'm definitely still not an expert. I will never call myself an expert, um, but I am passionate about what I do. Um, I'm passionate about continuously learning and teaching others what I know. Today, we will be discussing details on building the physical space, planting, and how to maintain your garden. And I'm going to start by explaining what are native plants and how gardening with native plants may differ from what we are typical garden experiences. So why native? What are native plants? They're over thousands of years, wild plants have grown naturally, adapting to each region's very unique um, environmental conditions, and developing relationships with the native wildlife. Um, the loss of native plant community, communities has reduced wildlife habitat and genetic diversity, which is necessary for balanced ecosystems. So unlike many non-native plants, native plants introduced into landscape plantings tend to be hardy, they're less susceptible to pests and diseases, and they're unlikely to escape and become invasive. So one of the things that defines native plants is where they grow. Ecoregions um, are, are something that we in the native plant industry um, really pay attention to. They are they take into account far more than just the heat of a region, the the, the what can grow in a region. It takes into account the hydrology, the soil. Um, weather patterns, uh, geology, all kinds of things over time. 
So they these things can also change, uh, especially with climate change, but it's way slower, way slower. Um, and we've grown accustomed to following growing zones, which we know recently changed. Um, but when it comes to native plants, it's more important to understand what ecoregion you reside in. So for example, in New England, we have the following ecoregions. We have the Northeastern Highlands, the Northeastern Coastal, Acadian Plains and Hills, Acadian Coastal Pine Barrens, Eastern Great Lakes, Lowlands. Um, and if you really want to dig in, you can go all the way down to the ecoregions of Massachusetts, uh, which takes into account microclimates of different areas. So what's native to um, Nantucket isn't necessarily native to Natick. So this is the old grow zone map. I haven't updated it yet. Um, but why do we want to focus on ecoregions instead of the more familiar growing zones? Growing zones refer to the temperature changes in an area, what can grow somewhere rather than what should grow here. Um, zone six can encompass areas like uh, uh, most of Massachusetts now, um, all the way down across the Great Plains and up into Washington state. Um, however, the plants that are native in Washington state are not the same ones that are native here. Um, they both support totally different species of wildlife. Planting outside of the ecoregion can have very serious repercussions on vulnerable wildlife populations. Um, so with that recent change to the USDA growing zones, uh, a lot of people were very happy because they thought they could grow more plants. And they, that's very true for uh, things like food crops, food production. Um, but a lot of people that made it that... that very happy to, to hear that. Um, but it doesn't necessarily change anything as far as we're concerned, because our ecoregion did not change. So speaking of um, specialists, we want to talk about host plants. Um, host plants are those which support most or all of the different life stages of an organism, more than just providing nectar or pollen for adults. One of the best species to highlight this is the monarch butterfly. Um, it's well known that the monarch butterfly requires the Asclepius or milkweed family to, um, in order to complete its life cycle. The adult monarchs lay their eggs on the milkweed plants. The larvae hatch and the caterpillars, which have evolved protections against the milky sap, um, then feed on the milkweed leaves. The flowers do provide nutritious nectar for um, adult monarchs as well. So it's covering that entire life cycle. Since the monarchs pretty much put all of their evolutionary eggs in one basket, they've become solely dependent on milkweed plants for survival. And as milkweed populations have dropped through the century, we see, we've see we seen um, what that means for the monarch butterfly. Um, and this, isn't, this is just one example of a host plant interaction. So, so many of our um, native insects are specialists on native plants. Um, so without those native plants, we will see, and we are seeing a precipitous drop in these native insects. So getting right to it, um, our garden goals. When we first start thinking about building a new garden bed, we usually default to what's most pleasing to our eyes. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we want color, we want texture, and for many people, edibility is, is an important factor. Of course, we do see, uh, enjoy seeing colorful butterflies and, and all our birds um, coming around, but it's really the visual impact that is our primary concern. Um, when you're looking to build a native plant bed, there may be other considerations. So what are your main drivers for installing this bed? Are you interested in birding? Um, native plants are imperative for supporting many of our native songbirds. And it takes more than just planting um, lots of seeds or berries. Are you looking for more wildlife diversity, uh, supporting pollinators specifically? Do you want do you have um, do you want to build a garden that can handle uh, more weather extremes like we have seen over the past few years? Um, going from the hottest summer on record to the wettest summer on record to the hottest summer on record to the wettest summer on record. Like, eh, what are you supposed to do? 
Um, do you have problematic areas of your landscape that could potentially be addressed with caref careful plant selection? We'll go through all of those, a lot of information. Um, so my plants bring all the songbirds to the yard. It doesn't work. It doesn't work musically, but it, it works um, when you talk about native plants. So in practice, native plants are a game changer if you want these beautiful birds in your yard. Uh, if you do follow Dr. Talamy's work, you've most likely heard of his um, then grad student, uh, Dr. Desiree Narango, and her study of chickadees raising their young on soft bodied insects. So Dr. Narango determined that the parent chickadees foraged and fed between 6,000 and 9,000 soft bodied insects, so caterpillars, uh, to their young for the roughly two week period from hatching to fledging. Um, so these insects are most often caterpillars. They're the larval stage of butterflies and moths. Um, and they typically forage in a very small area. So how do we support more native birds? It isn't, <clears throat> excuse me, just about putting out bird feeders full of seeds. It means putting way more host plants into concentrated areas. So if you want to see an increase in songbird diversity in your yard, planting masses of host plants is a great way to support the entire lifespan of these birds. Told you. <clears throat> um, one of your garden goals may be to increase wildlife diversity across the board, become a real wildlife haven. The problem is that that some have isn't that we can't pick and choose what wildlife uses our landscape as habitat because wow, if we could, right? Uh, that would be amazing. So a big concern about planting grasses and tall perennials <clears throat> is creating a welcome habitat for so-called pest species like um, mice and ticks. Hopefully you tuned into Blake's presentation and you learned a ton because amazing. Um, but in general, it does take a bit of a mind shift when we talk about building habitat. If you're choosing host plants to support butterflies and birds, um, you are creating perfect nesting grounds for mice. It's just what happens. If you have mice, you are supporting predatory species like owls, foxes, and hawks. So don't set out rodents aside. That would be terrible. Don't do that. Um, sometimes new builds can get out of balance, but it's important to put on your patient pants and um, wait everything out. And these imbalances tend to work themselves out over a little bit of time. Coming off of one of the rainiest years in recent history, many people have experienced issues with flooding where they have it in the past. My own basement has flooded multiple times. And we had to dig a shallow trench during the last big rainstorm um, in the in January to divert the water pouring out of our gutters. Like it just overwhelmed everything. And think we've had a lot of work done on our house um, in our yard, and it's so hard packed. The water's just coming right in. Um, so there are so-called specialty gardens that can be used to mitigate specific issues like rain gardens to slow and divert excess water. <clears throat> Hell strip plots where plants are choose, chosen for their ability to withstand, withstand extreme roadside conditions. So if you have a particularly stubborn area, chances are you could turn lemons into roses. Fun, huh? A lot of us in the industry have been focused on creating drought tolerant spaces. Um, and that's really important. Um, we are consistently seeing record temperatures and extreme weather events. It's often a selling point for native plants that they are collectively deep rooted and drought tolerant. Um, and that's a problematic statement to make. Um, I could do an entire presentation on plant physiology, but the short version is that blanket statements about plant roots are not applicable only to the plants native to any particular region and that all native plants are automatically drought tolerant. Um, if you fill your dry landscape with native wetland plants, um, it's really unlikely that they're gonna survive, let alone thrive without really intense water supplementation. So that's the opposite of what we're looking to do. You've probably heard of the phrase, right plant, right place. 
And that means selecting plants based on the existing criteria, what you have going on right now. We're not looking to add a whole bunch of things. We're looking at what we have happening right now. Um, and that also means that um, drought tolerance and, and, and stability after they're very well established. So you're not gonna get drought tolerance when plants are newly established. You're gonna have to take care of them for the first season or two. Once they're well established, they're most likely going to be better able to tolerate most weather conditions. Um, we're going to get into the practical aspects of how we select plants for specific conditions too. So when customers come to the nursery and they ask for recommendations for their yard, I want to know three things. What kind of soil are they planting in? How much sun does that plot receive? And how much water is naturally present? Um, these questions are absolutely imperative to building a successful garden of any type, but it's really important when it comes to building a native plant bed. Right plant, right place. We want to choose plants that are optimally suited for the space in order to give them the best shot of thriving. So we want to look at how, what type of soil you have, and this doesn't have to be a scary thing. Um, there's two ways you can go about figuring out what kind of soil you do have. One method is low cost and low tech. So like my favorite thing, cause we see how I do a technology. Uh, the second method costs a little bit more, but it gives you a ton of information. So we're looking at a very broad example here of soil makeup tonight. You want to think of it as a, more of a spectrum. This is a very broad brush we're painting here. Um, even different parts of your yard may have different um, soil types, sometimes drastically different soil types. The primary soil types are sand, sandy loam, and clay. And each of these types have different drainage levels associated with them. So every soil sample is going to have different <clears throat> percentages of each of these. Um, and if you're looking to plant out different areas of your landscape, it's better to perform um, a separate test for each area. So you can easily determine the overall makeup of your soil by doing the mason jar test. Um, all you need for this is a mason jar or a larger spaghetti jar with a lid and a, a trowel or a small shovel. So you're going to choose the area of your yard that you want to test and you want to dig down past the top soil layer, roughly the depth of the trowel. Uh, take a good scoop of soil from that depth and fill the mason jar about halfway. Fill the rest of the way with clean water, secure the lid and give it a really good shake. Uh, you want it to thoroughly mix up so that the um, soil is like fully mixed up with the water and you're going to set it aside for a few days and let it really settle. You're going to see um, when it's ready to look at when there is a clear delineation from the water and the different soil types. Um, you're going to, um, the layers are gonna separate into the same kind of layers here. So you have sand will go all the way to the bottom. Whatever silty layer you have will be in the middle. And then you may have a, a thin layer of clay, or you may have a thick layer of clay. That's entirely possible too. You'll have a layer of water, and then you may have little bits and bobs floating at the top, which we refer to as organic matter. So depending on the ratio of these layers, that's going to tell you on a macro level what kind of soil you have. If you have more sand than the rest, you have sandy soil. If you have more clay, you have clay soil. Very easy. If you're looking for a very far more in-depth assessment of your soil, uh, we have an amazing resource in the UMass Amherst Extension. So for a very reasonable price, you can send a soil sample to them and receive back a detailed report along with an amendment recommendation based on your anticipated use of the plot. So this is especially helpful if for in-ground food production or if there was a um, if you're like that area of your landscape may have been compromised um, with um, any uh, pollution of some kind. Um, so make sure you're very specific in your requests about what you plan on planting in that area so that the recommendations are accurate for you. And to be clear, this would probably be total overkill if you're planting a native pollinator garden, but it would be very, very useful if you're planting a food garden. 
so there are a lot of native plants that can handle a fairly broad spectrum of sunlight. It's very confusing to people when I ask them how much sun an area gets, because I usually get uh, it gets a few hours here and there. Um, <clears throat> you may see on our nursery signage what seems like conflicting information. Uh, it seems counterintuitive that a plant might like full sun into shade, um, but often it means that a plant can tolerate that spectrum, but will thrive at one end of it. Um, so for example, a plant may grow just fine in a shady spot, but if you put it in full sun, it'll explode with flowers, right? So on the other hand, a plant may grow fine in full sun, but it may be a little stunted or it may grow go dormant much earlier in the season than that same plant in shadier conditions. Um, and this criteria grows hand in hand with the moisture content of the soil. There are a plethora of like wetland species that absolutely thrive on the fullest of sun. Um, but if that soil is not dripping, sopping wet, they are not going to be very happy at all. So in general, full sun would be an area receiving six plus hours um, throughout the day. And it could be morning sun, could be afternoon sun, doesn't matter, six plus hours throughout the day. Uh, part sun would be roughly four to six hours, part shade, three to four hours of sun, shade, less than three hours, or, or uh, dappled sunlight. Um, don't go, don't overthink it. This is another one where you just don't want to overthink this. This is a really great example. I love to pull this out. Um, this is someone on the internet that I pulled this photo down. They did an amazing job. All they did was they divided their yard up into sections and they went out there and used their eyeballs as cheap as it gets. And they looked at the different hours and wrote down how much sun each spot was getting. So by the end of one day, they were able to tell um, how many hours of sun that back corner garden got. That is a full sun garden. Um, so I'm not sure. Yeah, and their vegetable garden is a full sun garden too. So um, both of those areas are really nice um, for food production and, and, some, and full sun plants. Easy peasy. Um, no matter what you do plant, new plants are going to need supplemental water throughout the first growing season. 100% must happen. Unless, of course, we have another summer like we just did where we had um, plenty of rain. Most things uh, didn't need extra water at all. Um, transplanting is very hard on plants and it gets harder the larger the plant that you install. So regular and deep watering reduces the stress of transplanting on establishing root systems. If you're not sure what your existing water levels are, um, there's another low-tech test for you. The day after a decent rainstorm, go to the area you're looking at and dig up a good shovel full of dirt. Um, down towards the bottom of that hole, grab a handful of the soil and squeeze it in the palm of your hand. Dry soil is going to fall apart easily when you open your hand. Um, and that means you have dry soil or well, well drained soil. Average soil is going to mostly stay together and fall apart with a little poking. Moist soil will stay really well formed in your hand and wet soil will drip water when you squeeze it. Remember, this is the day after a uh, decent rainstorm. Um, so we do wanna be water wise, understanding that clean water in and of itself is no longer a guarantee in so many parts of this world. We're definitely privileged in this area to have an abundance of clean drinking water, um, but that obviously is not guaranteed. So by instilling water wise habits, we can help conserve water while also, also safely ensuring our gardens remain lush. Um, installing rain barrels is cheap and highly effective. Uh, during times of extreme drought, we can um, buckle down and use water in other ways, saving water from our shower warming up, collecting water from our dehumidifiers and air conditioners to use in our gardens, um, uh, and in using, utilizing what rainstorms we do get in our rain barrels during those drought times. So you may be wondering how effective rain barrels can be if we're experiencing a drought. And it's surprising how much water runs off of our structures, even during really short summer rains. 
A single thousand square foot roof collects approximately 560 gallons of uh, water per inch of rainfall, right? So you do that little math that you take the square foot of your um, house times 0.56, yes. Um, and that gives you an approximately how much collect collection of rain you can get per inch of rainfall. Um, so even if we get a, you know, relatively quick afternoon storm, you could very easily fill up a few rain barrels. So go crazy and add rain barrels to every roof line from the shed to the garage, greenhouse, you'll have more access to water during the heat of the summer. You can also install a drip irrigation system off of your rain barrels by using a simple pump system, or you can use the, the barrels to manually water your plants. Um, to supplement any rain that we do get. So regardless of what method you choose, try to water the ground rather than from overhead. And this reduces the amount of water wasted to evaporation, as well as being the most efficient way to get the water to the roots of the plants. That's where it counts. Uh, preparation, oh, I went too fast, sorry. Uh, preparation is key. So now we're going to talk about how to prepare a site for planting, um, talking about timing and um, size and a little bit of design too. So for timing, um, it really depends on where you are right now. So right now we're heading into spring, still have a little bit of time. You could still kind of do the winter for spring planting. You, it, could, it could totally happen. So when you're looking to break ground for a new garden bed, you can help yourself and your back by choosing the right method based on the time of year. So arguably the least labor intensive, I love labor and less labor intensive, that's great. Uh, time and method would be the late fall um, and through the winter um, to prepare for a spring planting. You can cut the grass very low and then cover the area with layers of newspaper or plain cardboard. Um, and then you top that with leaves from your yard and water it all really well. And then you leave it. You just leave it. You don't have to do anything else. Um, I like the idea of covering it with the leaves because then you can, you don't have like newspaper flying all around your yard um, and your neighbors aren't looking at you sideways. Um, in the springtime, you can cut directly through the what will be very soggy cardboard and plant into the soil beneath. Um, you really want to keep the leaves in place as mulch. You just, you know, spread them apart a little bit um, and plant right down into there. You could use compost on top, but I'd be cautious not to use overly rich compost as that may be too strong for many of our native plants. So if spring rolls around and you have to clear an area quickly or you have a very large area to clear, you could dig it up um, or you could select, carefully select an herbicide that will kill the grass. I know that's a hot button topic and it's not for everyone, um, but I did want to say that select herbicides properly used in the proper dosages uh, do have their place. Um, it's not typically something that I would choose, but it's an option. Um, if you are starting a new bed in the summertime, um, which is not generally recommended because of the heat, but you want to avoid the use of herbicide, you could either cut and flip the sod, which is very labor intensive, or you could solarize, which may have some negative effects on uh, the soil organisms. Um, but solarizing requires you to take a sheet of really thick plastic um, and cover the area that you're planting. Um, some people recommend black plastic for the heat. Some people recommend clear plastic uh, for the greenhouse effect. Either way, I think you'll come out with the same um, effect and that is really cooking everything <laughs> underneath of it. You wanna make sure your edges are down tight and you wanna do this during the heat of the summer. Um, so the idea is that, um, you might get some prolific growth at first because of the, the heat um, starting to germinate everything, but really it's going to cook everything underneath that sheet. And it takes weeks for this to really, really work. Um, so if you're gonna do this, you can do this over the summer and that will prepare the area for the fall. So this next part, 
that is very overwhelming to people is actually choosing the plants you want in your garden. And it can be really tempting to go buy one of everything that looks good at the nursery, but um, it is better practice to find three or five, three to five species um, and focus your initial efforts on those. So luckily there's a lot of really great resources out there to help you figure out which plants to choose. I just so happen to know a couple of uh, ladies who have created a website that allows you to filter uh, according to the sun and soil, along with other things like bird friendly or health strip, uh, seasonal interest. So make sure you have a variety of heights and bloom times, and you'll be well on your way to planting a really great garden bed. Um, so when you're looking at the bloom times, we don't want um, like a riot of color in June and then nothing but green for the rest of the summer. Like it's fine, but kind of boring. Um, it's also really important to have something blooming from the very early spring all the way into the late fall in order to best support our native bees. So you can find bloom times on each plant page on our website and um, places like Native Plant Trust um, also give bloom, bloom times for their uh, plants. So very important. Um, evaluate how you use your property. You wanna make your lawn reflect your lifestyle. You can completely remove your lawn if you want to, but in reality, most people use their lawn for recreation. So make your lawn reflect your lifestyle. Really take some time to think about how you use your yard now and in the foreseeable future. So do you have dogs? Do you have kids? Do you host super competitive neighborhood volleyball games? Um, however it is, be realistic about it. Use your lawn in strips as pathways to show intent um, around more natural spaces. And just how your lawn is reflecting how you live, so should your garden spaces. Um, native plants have a reputation for looking weedy or out of control, but they definitely don't have to. Um, you can get on the rewild bandwagon and plant things willy-nilly, or your taste may trend more towards uh, manicured um, or a more cultivated look. My personal type of landscaping is um, a bit of chaos, um, which kind of reflects my life in general. But um, there's a lot of ecological value that comes with a bit of chaos. Whoop, I did it again chaos. Um, this is kind of part of my vision board for my own landscape. Clear pathways, uh, beautiful chaos in the beds. So remember your garden doesn't have to be all native. Um, we want to aim for more native than non-native, maybe like around 70% would be great. Um, perfection isn't the goal. Progress, not perfection. Ooh, a lot of information. We're still, we're still chugging. Um, so there's a lot more than one way to fill a garden space. Um, a lot of it has to do with cost, availability of plants, and your own patience levels. Um, it's a very good plan to combine all of these methods to build a garden that has succession uh, built into it. Succession planting refers both to the timing of plant ages as well as when different species are made to fill in a space. And I'll get into more detail in a few minutes. The most economical way to fill a space is to sow seeds in the late fall, early winter, which is kind of mind blowing to people who are used to starting seeds in the spring. Um, but starting them, just sowing them into the ground um, late fall, early winter allows seeds to naturally stratify, uh, which is the way seeds use cold, moist cycles of winter to break down the, the tough seed coat and allow germination to come in the spring. This method costs the least. It can potentially cover a large area, and it's arguably the least labor intensive. Um, it will give you a more wild look with lots of species mixed together. So if you don't want to direct sow in the fall, you can also look into the winter sowing method using milk jugs or plant flats, or you could artificially stratify in the fridge. And I don't have time to get into how to do those things, but we do have a little bit more detail on our website under seeds if you would like more details on that. 
Um, so plugs are very small plants with well-grown root systems. They're typically first-year seedlings, and they can vary in size from two to six inches. Um, and when we talk about inches, we're talking about the root systems um, in length. Most of the time, plugs are used by nurseries to pot up into larger plants, and they're often used in conservation projects. Plugs are generally not available to the general public, um, but groups and businesses are sometimes able to order large quantities. Um, they do make it an economical way to fill larger areas, and they are ideal to plant in between larger plants to fill in over time. These plants may be relatively small on the um, surface. They can look real puny, um, but the healthy root systems below will adapt faster to your soils. But since we are very impatient creatures, um, it's one thing to spread seeds and put in some plugs, and it's another to have the patience to wait um, one or two or even three full growing seasons, three years before you see um, sizable plants and flowers. Um, most of us would give up by then. <laughs> so it's probably one of the more discouraging aspects of gardening with perennials. Um, nursery plants are often in their like second year of growth when you start to see them um, really big lush plants. Um, they may be closer to flowering than the other options. So it can be very helpful to install a handful of larger plants, add in some plugs, and sow some seeds around. This is going to ensure a continuous growth of plants that you love um, at a much more reasonable cost. So when it comes to actually getting our hands dirty, we want to focus on digging as little as possible. Um, that seems very counterintuitive to planting a garden. We're used to tilling and digging and, and all of that stuff. Um, digging into soil disrupts the very intricate ecosystem of microorganisms, and it actually serves to compact your soil over time. So the best practice is just dig a hole just a little bit larger than your plant's pot. Um, and it just as deep. You don't want to put your plant any deeper into the soil than it is already in the pot. Um, so go ahead and press that plant right into the hole. It can be kind of tight. Just go ahead and press it down. Fill in any extra space with the soil that you removed and press gently down with your hands to make sure you have good contact with the soil. Water it really well and there you have it. Um, so doesn't less work sound really good? Yeah, it does. More plants in the ground. I'm going to fast forward a little bit and we're going to learn how to manage the lush garden that we have build, been building. Um, no need to clean. This is my favorite topic. I can't, I think I have to like copy and paste something um, into all the Facebook groups right now. Everybody is dying to get out there and clean up. Um, in the spring, lots of people love to say, wait until the temperatures are consistently above 50 degrees before cleaning up. Um, in actuality, there isn't an exact temperature that triggers all of the bees to come out because if there was, we would be swarmed by now. This is especially true when we're talking about specialist bees. Um, they need very particular plants to forage on. Um, so if these plants haven't bloomed yet, chances are good the bees are going to remain in the ground for a while longer. Regardless of when they emerge, these insects need to find nesting sites. So in the fall, um, they're looking for nesting sites. Um, it does take a mind shift to stop seeing decaying plants as a mess and rather as a very important aspect of a thriving ecosystem. And along with um, ground dwelling, many native bees use standing plant matter to lay their eggs um, and for them to overwinter. So there are many bee species that will pack a nectar bag, lay an egg, and then plug the entrance um, to some of those like really pithy stems. And then the larvae will hatch, eat the nectar, and then it will chew its way out of the stem. So leaving these stems behind in the fall provides this habitat as well as supporting like a ton of other wildlife. Um, if you absolutely must remove old stems, you would want to wait until the nighttime temperatures are consistently in the 50s, at least. Um, this puts you like mid to end of May. So again, 
pack those, pull out those patient pants um, and wait, 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 still time to wait. Uh, another concern about native plants is about how tall some of them can get and how easy they um, they might flop over. Um, so one easy way to manage these issues is a practice called the Chelsea chop. And this is so named because of the timing of the chop. It's generally done end of May into June, and that's around the time of the um, illustrious Chelsea flower show. Uh, the idea is very simple. You let the plants grow through the spring, and before they're setting flower buds, you want to chop them down about halfway or, or to a third of their height. And this will spur new plant growth, and you should end up with stockier, fuller plants. Um, this may cause a slight delay in flowering. So if that's really a concern, you can always leave a few taller stems to flower and chop the others. Um, this process is especially useful for the milkweed plants. My cat. <laughs> um, if you've ever seen milkweeds toward the end of summer, they the leaves turn black and they get very tough. Um, chopping them in stages encourages new growth and allows for a fresh flush of leaves for the monarch caterpillars to munch on. Again, don't overthink this. Plan on chopping summer blooming plants like milkweed, liatris, bee balm around like Memorial Day, the latest Father's Day, um, and fall blooming plants like our goldenrods and asters by the 4th of July. Dividing plants. So timing does matter. This is a process that can be done when your garden is full and you're finding that some plants are starting to crowd out others or they're looking choked um, or you want to make room for new plants. Um, it's not generally something you want to do in the heat of the summer, but a great time to divide plants is in the early fall uh, when um, the plants are going, starting to go dormant and sending all of their energy into their roots. Different species are gonna have different ways of dividing, but generally speaking, you wanna use sharp tools, disinfect the tools in between each group of plants. Um, you can dig out the plants and shake the soil back into the hole. Um, you can split them right down the middle, just like you can see in the picture. You don't have to be super, super gentle with them. Most of these plants are pretty darn tough um, and they can handle it. Um, so shake that soil back into the hole, move the plants to a new space, or you can share with your neighbors. You can divide plants in the spring, very early spring, um, preferably before they break dormancy, but this is really dicey. Um, and you really have to know where your plants were last year, um, and what you're transplanting. So, um, the fall is definitely a preferred time frame. And as always, Make sure you really water your plants well before and after dividing. Before is going to um, soften up that soil, make it a little easier for you. And afterwards, you want to um, water both sections of the plants so you can reduce transplant shock. Seed collection. Um, plants can take a few years to grow large enough to produce seeds. And you really should wait until the plants are very well established before collecting seeds. Remember that collecting seeds in the wild from public spaces is um, at the very least frowned upon, um, and oftentimes it's illegal. So where permission is granted, it's best practice to remove 10% or less of the seeds from any given species and to never completely strip any one plant of all its seeds. Um, in your own garden, of course, you can do whatever you want. But remember, a big reason for planting these natives is to provide food and habitat for wildlife. And many birds will come visit your garden in the winter to enjoy the seeds left behind. So when you're collecting seeds, you want to get a positive identification when the plant is in bloom, tag it plant location somehow. Um, when you see the flower bloom starting to fade, you can make your collection easier by placing one of those tool bags um, over the plant heads that you want to collect. Leave the bags in place until the plant is in dormancy and you can see the seed heads turn color, usually like a dried tan color. Um, label and store your seeds in a paper envelope, like a coin envelope, and in a cool, dry place. 
So I spoke earlier about succession planting when it comes to the ages of plants. And that basically means providing a range of ages for the species you want in your garden. So there'll always be a continuation of these plants. Another version of succession planting um, has a more ecological basis. In succession planting, you're using plants that have varying lifespans and some plants that do well in the early stages of a garden with more disturbance while others have a longer lifespan or um, require less disturbance. So have you ever heard the adage that you never see the same garden twice? This refers to succession planting. Early succession plant examples are annuals and biennials that complete their life cycles in a year or two, such as like thistles, rudbeckia, and partridge pea. These plants th thrive in uh, thin soils and are often found in recently disturbed areas, such as after a burn or in disked fields. Um, this is one reason why gardeners might get frustrated when they have plants that did so well for a year or two and then they disappear. You can use this to your advantage, getting fast blooms while your slower perennials are settling in. Um, so some of these native plants that do thrive in disturbed soils, these, they range from um, big natural events like a wildfire fire down to just simply raking the soil in a garden bed. Um, the preference for disturbance may explain why some of your favorite flowering plants bloom so beautifully for like a year or two, and then they seem to disappear completely. You don't have to set your garden ablaze to keep your flowers. Um, luckily, there's an easier way. One of my favorite examples of a plant that prefers disturbance is Monarda. Also known as bee balm, Monarda loves a little chaos. Um, all you have to do is give the ground a little firm raking in the early spring where you've planted Monarda. And I can't explain the mechanics behind why it works, but it usually does. If you struggled with keeping Monarda in your garden before, give this a shot. Um, you don't have to dig down, just stir the surface a bit. Using plant as ground covers is one of the best ways you can increase the sustainability of your garden. Sometimes it's referred to as green mulch or living mulch, plants that shade the ground, keep the soil cooler, they reduce moisture loss, and they prevent sunlight from germinating um, other seeds that are blown in or exist in the soil already. So if you're looking for a lower maintenance garden, using plants is really the ticket. And it is true that many plants labeled as ground cover tend to spread quickly, and that can be really disconcerting for someone who likes tidy edges. There's nothing stopping you from using your favorite garden borders to help keep ground covers in place. And if you use those lovely lawn paths, mowing will help maintain those edges as well. So even in areas that we are rewilding, we can use native plants to maintain a green lawn appearance. Turfgrass lawns are a monoculture that supports very little wildlife, um, but we do have wonderful lawn replacements that do support pollinators. Uh, wild strawberry helps support 81 species of Lepidoptera. Um, clover is not native, but um, it does um, help feed um, bees and uh, bunnies. Bunnies love it. Um, so maybe it'll keep, your, keep them away from your other plants. Uh, wild violets, cinquefoil, prunella, and Pennsylvania sedge is a lovely lawn alternative. <clears throat> uh, leaving the leaves, using your whole leaf matter that falls from your trees as a natural mulch for your garden. You'll protect the many overwintering butterfly and moth species that are cocooned in the leaf litter. Leaf litter also promotes further drought tolerance and adds nutrients to the soil as it decomposes. I was really shocked to learn how many Lepidoptera overwinter in cocoons that look exactly like leaves and sticks. Um, if you mow these leaves or use leaf blowers to push litter into piles, you're causing uh, damage to many of these organisms. Um, have you ever wondered why we don't see as many fireflies like we did as kids? This is, is a big reason why. Um, obviously, we have to be reasonable about this. Clear leaves away from your foundation and your walkways. Um, gently rake excess leaves into an unused corner um, or onto your beds and let them decompose in place. Ooh, okay, so I know I just rapid fired a ton of information at you, um, but we I didn't even scratch the surface of how much um, 
plant information there is out there. So you can go ahead to, if you go to our website, bluestemnatives.com, we have what to plant lists for different areas. If you have um, containers or deer resistant or health strip or any of those other things that we talked about, um, you can pull those up and it'll tell you what plants should work there. Um, and you can also check out a whole bunch of different amazing books um, that have information beyond your wildest dreams um, that can help with all of these uh, issues as well. And ta-da, that's it for me tonight. Happy to take any questions. Okay, we've got a couple of questions. The first one says, I didn't cut back my native perennials in the fall. When is the best time for me to cut them back this spring? Do I cut them back to the ground? Um, ideally, you don't cut them back at all. And just let them grow. Um, the new plants are going to come up and cover those old stems anyway, and then they'll fall down and decompose in place. If you absolutely just cannot bear to leave them, you'll want to really wait until the nighttime temperatures are over 50 degrees consistently. So like literally end of May by which time things are coming up anyway. So <laughs> I would wait. How about using water from a basement sump pump to water? I don't necessarily see an issue with that. I would think I would absolutely do not use that on any edible food production um, uh, plots, uh, but for your perennials, your shrubs and trees, I don't think I, I think, I don't think of any issue you could, if you had any inkling that there may be some kind of, um, pollution, you could always get your water tested and see, like test that water from your sump pump and make sure that there's nothing funky on it, but I don't see any issue with it. Okay. When should I expect to see results from fall seeding? When will seedlings appear? It completely depends on what you seeded. Um, there are some plants that you'll start seeing probably, I would say very, with the temperatures we've been seeing late April, you'll start seeing very little things. Um, do not freak out if you don't see your milkweeds coming up because those don't sprout until the midsummer anyway. Um, and then you have other things that won't sprout until the fall. So, or, you know, later summer. Um, so yeah, we get time. I know it feels really warm. It's freakishly warm. It's freaking out all of us that are like, this is really bad. Um, there's time, there's lots of time. So don't go poking around the leaves yet. All right. If I need to add soil to my garden, what kind of soil should I add? I would be questioning why you need to add soil. Um, if you're planting for food, obviously food products are um, more nutrient dependent. So I would do a, a nice rich compost. If you're looking at native plants, you the whole idea is that you shouldn't have to add soil. Um, I can't... If you have clay soil, you want to plant plants that can work in clay soil already. Um, you don't really want to have to amend it all that well, all that much. If you're adding a bunch of compost to your plants, so many of our plants really don't like the added nutrients um, and it would actually stunt them, uh, slow them down and they really don't fare well. So don't. Okay, the next question says, I've been removing invasive plants from my yard and letting natives grow for the last few years. I have four tooth sink foil everywhere, but I can't figure out whether I should keep it or not. What's a good resource? Um, I, if you can, if you have positively identified it, you can check um, the Native Plant Trust, Go Botany. That is our go-to resource um, for all kinds of plants. There's wonderful information. Sometimes it can be a little hard, a little more on the science-y side of things, but you can really kind of dig in and get some great information for that. Um, that would probably be my first um, go-to. 
Okay, we have a huge amount of invasive ground covers such as ivy. Should we wait until the end of May to pull it up? I generally, when you're removing a large space, I tell people to make sure they have a plan in place. So right now could be a good time to pull up the IV as long as you are really prepared in like by the end of April or so to get plants in the ground, like to cover that ground up. Um, because as soon as you remove that ivy, you're going to be exposing the soil um, to sun that it didn't have before. And whatever seeds were in that uh, seed bank in that soil are going to go wild. So if you're going to remove a large patch of invasives, awesome. Good job. Um, but really have a plan. Like you can't remove a large patch of ivy in the spring and be like, oh, I'll let it sit over the summer and do it in the fall. You'll have like triple the nightmare on your hands come the fall. So remove, even if you have to do it in smaller sections, remove plant, remove plant, like fill in the spaces as fast as you can. Okay, it looks like that was our last question. Thank you, Kristen, for an amazing presentation and thank you everyone for coming. Um, I hope you guys will join us tomorrow for Achieving a Beautiful Garden with Drought Tolerant Plants. And then I hope you'll also join us on Saturday at Kennedy's Country Gardens for our live expo. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.